Hey folks, we're back again. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad so many of you joined us last week. Uh, many of you commented and we're thankful for that. If you're with us today, we're going to be looking at Psalm 23. We're going to be looking at it in the context of worry as we continue this series on when emotions rise. So as you join us, uh, just we're encouraged to have you with us. And if it's an encouragement to you, we ask that you uh, share it and encourage others with it as well. So Christy's going to kick us off as we get started looking at Psalm 23. Okay, so as Daniel said, we're in Psalm 23 about worry today. Um, overcoming worry is how the writer um, po pointed it out today. And the point of the lesson is that God's presence provides a way out of worry. And as Daniel said, we're looking at Psalm 23 and how David compares the sheep and his relationship with the shepherd and God's care for his people. Um, the introduction, if you have your book and you've read that, talks about um, the world offers us a lot of things to worry about, and it does. Terrorism, global tensions, economy, politics, etc. And then we also face many worries in our own lives with our, within our families, um, our health, um, our job security, retirement, things like that that's more tangible to us. We all know that we're not supposed to worry. And one reason we're not supposed to worry is it's not good for our health. According to the National Institutes of Health, chronic stress and worry lead to weakened immune systems, high blood pressure, ulcers, backaches, headaches, all those things that you contribute to worry definitely makes a difference on your physical body. And as we look at Psalm 23, we're going to see how that just having God's presence with us all day long, every day, will help us with our worry and help us not to worry so much. All right, so I'm going to start out. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 23, the first three verses. They're familiar verses to many of you. And uh, we're reading uh, the Christian Standard Bible uh, produced by Lifeway. So if the words are a little bit different for you, uh, that's where we're getting it from. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Okay, so Psalm 23 um, talks about the sheep and the shepherds. And the sheep, I don't know of any mascots for any football teams that are sheep. Now, maybe a ram is the closest thing, and that's definitely not even a sheep. Because sheep are stupid. They're weak creatures and they can't survive on their own. So we wouldn't want to use them as a mascot fighting really hard for our team. So David wrote this Psalm because he was a shepherd. We don't know if he wrote it as he was shepherding, probably looking back as the several commentaries have said when he was a king, kind of looking back on his life as a shepherd. But we know that he had a personal relationship with his sheep because he was a shepherd and that's what shepherds do. And he cherished her sheep, just like any shepherd would. And probably, well, actually we know that he risked his life for his sheep um, because now we can read it in scripture that he fought off a bear and a lion just to protect his sheep. And then we'll look at how this um, Psalm correlates with Jesus being our good shepherd. And that's found in John chapter 10, verses 11 to 15. I'm gonna read that to you real quick. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and runs away, the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me. And I know the father and I lay down my life for my sheep. So David, as being a shepherd, he took care of his sheep and he knew them and God loves us and takes care of us in that same way. So Daniel, you want to expound on verses one through three? So as we look at this passage and we think about this and so much of this, you have to remember, you have to step into the writer's shoes, if you will, um, probably sandals. But anyways, you need to get to where the writer was and you need to kind of get the visual imagery that they have and, and so this would have been rocky and hilly terrain uh, that they would have been in. And, you know, I, a lot of times we can be really critical of the word sheep because they are a 
an animal that doesn't seem to have a lot of great qualities just for their intelligence right off the bat. Uh, but I think that's probably a little wrongly misguided. And I think one of the ways we can do that is understand that a sheep is dependent, that they have to have care, uh, especially in the terrain that they were in. Uh, and so when David is describing this, you know, a sheep is not going to choose to walk up a mountainside cliff to get into the valley where the fresh green grass is growing in the spring. You know, as, as the thaw began and it began at the bottom of the mountain and began to work its way up, the sheep would have to transition from different pastures to different pastures. And these weren't huge, you know, 100 acre fields. These were two and three acres that were, you know, spotted next to a small stream or something uh, where the runoff from the mountain allowed the fertile grass to grow. And so, you know, you need to kind of get that picture in your mind of, of what is happening here. And so uh, understand the dependence that's happening. And I'm probably getting a little bit off track with all of that. But, you know, when we picture that, David is saying about himself, if God is my shepherd, as I have been the shepherd for the sheep, then there are places that he has taken me uh, where I abide beside him and I'm walking, uh, you know, I'm resting near green pastures. Um, and one of the words I have for that is anticipation. Um, for a sheep to, for a shepherd to adequately provide for his sheep, they had to anticipate what their needs were, and they also had to anticipate the next place where those needs could be met and how they could be provided. And God is that kind of God who is anticipating what our needs will be and how they can be met. Um, and when we think about that in our lives, it's, it may make it a little bit easier to go through the circumstances of our life, not necessarily without worry, but in the recognition that God is present in that moment itself. Uh, and there is a purpose in that moment. And you may not know it for a while, but there is purpose in that moment as well. Yeah, I think um, being us being sheep, it's not a term meant to insult us, but a term meant to humble us and to think about the um, how that we do need our shepherd, how that we do need that in our lives, not necessarily to insult us as being dumb or anything. Um, I like how in verses 1 through 3, um, David really makes this whole psalm very personal. You can read through it and count it. You use your fingers if you're like me. But it's 17 times that he makes this personal. With my shepherd, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. So just go through and count them. 17 times that he makes it that way. And in verses 1 through 3 that Daniel just read, he speaks about the Lord. And then we're about to read how he speaks to God as it being a personal thing. Um, the writer says that he guides us. He guides us through the toughness of any situation that we have going on. So if we do falter, like sometimes the sheep do, they fall away. He's not there to um, beat us over the head, but he's there to restore us and to guide us through whatever it is. And he provides for us. He meets our needs. This shepherd um, sheep thing really makes me think of a parent child relationship because like Daniel said anticipating the next need I know that if it's 12 o'clock even if my kids aren't asking for lunch you need to stop what you're doing and pick something to eat for them because it's time to eat um I mean they're gonna figure out their needs because they're gonna go get Debbie cakes and goldfish and they're gonna eat it but if you stop what you're doing and you take care of their needs and that's really what God does for us he stops and he takes care of all of our needs yeah, and that's, you know, the illustration she just used there of the kids is a really insightful because um, just as they would probably choose Little Debbie um, over a sandwich, you know, with peanut butter in it with the protein and those sorts of things, um, so too in our lives, we, we, we will choose, I mean, a sheep is going to choose, right? The, the reality of it, though, is they're not going to choose the difficult to obtain the good. Uh, and that picture is kind of finalized there in verse 3 where it says, He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Uh, there's a lot of paths that, that a sheep could choose. But the shepherd in his wisdom, uh, in his wisdom, knew where the fertile grounds were going to be, knew where the good streams were going to be. And so he chose to take the sheep down paths that they probably would not have chosen um, in order that they could get what they needed. And so this is a God who anticipates and then provides. And so just two things on that is this is a God who can provide for your needs is a God who is both present and who is observant. 
Um, so he's a present and he is able to see and uh, acknowledge what is happening in our lives. And two, look where he guides us. I think it's verse three. Um, it says, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then in verse two, it talks about green pastures and quiet waters. He leads us to relief. It's not just, um, okay, well, let me fix it this way and give you this. Mm -hmm. It's he offers us specific relief from whatever it is that we're going through. And before we transition to the next point, I would just challenge us in that because a lot of times we see relief as a material situation, uh, as having, you know, our finances at a, whatever level we think they should be. Uh, we see relief as a relational thing, as, you know, relationship with this person is correct and good or with this person or whatever. Um, but I will promise you that if you go through history and you read the stories of God's people, including the one who wrote this story right here, that they will tell you that the assurance of God's presence will accompany us in every situation and circumstance, even when the circumstances are horribly wrong. And just a quick thought on that, David, how in the world did David refuse to kill Saul when Saul was in the cave with him? There's no sane person in the world that would refuse that opportunity, except for the fact that he was assured that God was present with him. And as such, he did not have to take the matter into his own hand. So, and then we're going to look at how he, he contrasts that in the next section here if we're ready to move there. Mm -hmm. okay. right, do you want to read yeah. another book? Okay. I got it. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. So here we see a shift. We've talked about the Lord, and now we're talking yeah. to the Lord. We're crying out to him, as David did. So our worries that we might have sometimes actually become a reality. Um, the retirement issue might actually be a reality. The loss of a job, the loss of someone very dear to you might actually happen. The things that we've just worried about, even broken relationships. But God's presence makes all the difference in the world. As our shepherd, he protects us. Not protects us from all of this, but he protects us through everything. And to, in verse 4, he talks about walking through the darkest valley and how he fears no danger. And you are with me. David had learned, um, this is one of the writer's quotes here. David had learned not to feel terrorized by either calamity or the treachery of an evil man. And that was just very, uh, very much spoke volumes to me. He knew the Lord's presence because he had experienced the Lord's presence and his comfort. You know, and, and so he gives two pictures here, uh, two things. And once again, to catch yourself in the imagery of the moment. Uh, the staff would have been a, a long uh, rod, you know, would have been a long stick. Um, more than likely, it would have had been bent at the end. Um, and that we may talk about that in just a minute. But it would have been bent at the end to allow for maneuvering of sheep, essentially. Um, and the staff was a sign of, for the shepherd, it was his support when he was walking. Uh, he could lean on it when he was standing. Um, you know, those sorts of things. The rod would have been a club. Uh, much like a billy club or a baton, and it would have probably been tied around the shepherd's waist. Uh, and it would have been used to ward off, you know, a wild animal or, you know, something attacking the sheep or something. So the presence here is, you know, he says your rod and your staff, and, and it's just, and I've read this psalm since I was a kid, and I've, heard, I've read commentaries on this psalm, and I'm like, why, why does that, why do both of those pictures give David sustenance in this valley that is so deep and distressing. And I think it, it proves two things to him. Number one, when it, when the time comes and it is necessary, the shepherd will put himself at risk for the sheep. That's the rod. That's what it's for. Okay. Now, if you've heard those stupid stories that are made up about how the shepherd would break the sheep's leg and all that stupid stuff, uh, go back and research it. Okay. And if I offended you by calling it stupid, I'm sorry, but go back and research it. There's I have, I've tried, and I've read behind brilliant people who've tried as well. It's fabricated, but whatever. Uh, first of all, just imagine a 120 pound shepherd picking up an 85 pound ewe and carrying it on him, but whatever. 
that's a picture of the shepherd will engage for his sheep when it's necessary. And then the staff, well, that's just the overwhelming regular everyday presence that as he walks he's holding the staff when we're standing when we're in this valley where the green grass is i can look over and i can see the shepherd over there and he's leaning on his staff and it's a signal of of who the shepherd is and of his provision and care for the sheep uh, and so he's picturing both of those as he goes through that valley uh, and then he contrasts it immediately and says i go through this dark valley but in the meanwhile, you're preparing a table before me uh, in the presence of my enemies. And it's just a contrast of imagery of, of understanding that God is present. And even as the difficulties arise around him, that God was doing something for him uh, that no one else could do or would do. Yeah, I want to comment on the rod and the staff also. The rod and the staff were there for guidance and for protection. They were there to comfort the sheep, not to frighten the sheep. The sheep should not have been afraid of the rod and the staff because the rod was used, like Daniel said, to ward off the animals that might have been coming to harm the sheep, not for harming the sheep themselves. And you think of a parent-child relationship, that is not what we do. We do not intentionally harm our children. We take care of them. We love them. We comfort them. We want to take care of the people or the things that might be trying to harm our children. Um, he comforts us through the, the dangerous times. And then like he said in verse in verse 5, he talks about preparing a table and anointing his head with oil. And that's the picture to me of a host and a guest. Um, how that when food was lacking, when there wasn't any green food available for the sheep, the commentary that I read behind says that he laid down a leather strap on the ground and provided a supplement of food for them. And so that's the vision here of David laying down a leather strap, providing food for his sheep when they didn't have the correct food, um, supplementing them. And then a good host back in um, this Old Testament time would anoint their guest head with oil. We might give them a cup of coffee or give them a dessert to go, but this host here would anoint the head with oil. And so that's just, how that God is preparing a table for us and how in the presence of our enemies, he serves us, he satisfies us, and he honors us even in the presence of all the dangerous things that are going on around us. Yeah, the, the final, you know, phrase there is my cup overflows. Um, and that's a, I mean, that's a visual imagery that I think we all grasp pretty easily and that what David is really just saying is that not only do I have what I need, not only have I been in the most difficult of circumstances and were provided for, uh, but even when I think I've seen it all, there's more to come. And it's just an overwhelming uh, acknowledgement of God's presence. And uh, Christy noted that the tone as it changes in the psalm and I would challenge you as you read through the Psalms to notice that tonal change that, that happens in so many of the Psalms. Um, where they start out talking about God, then they transition to talking to God. Um, and then in, there's another, there's even later transitions as you read through those Psalms as well. So don't miss those changes um, and because they challenge us to go back to what we talked about last week and our anger. Um, it's not that you can't have anger and it's not that you shouldn't be angry. It's that what do you do with it? Who do you carry it to? Um, of course, last week we looked at how we, we, we take our anger to God and we tell him what our, our situation and our circumstances are. Now we'll read the very last verse, verse 6. So David summarizes with this. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. So here David closes with God's goodness, his love, his covenant relationship with God. And he says, surely, i um, not sure if this one uses surely, but I know that King James does. Um, that's only, only goodness will follow me all the days of my life. And follow here is not like me toddling around or um, after the, the baby and making sure he doesn't get all the stuff he's not supposed to have or making sure he's safe. This follow is like a pursuit, like I did when I was chasing you. 
I pursued him. I went after him. Didn't matter if anybody else was there or not. I was going after him. And guess what? I got him. So. I just saw that in her notes. I was like, I don't know if she's going to say that. Yeah, I'm going to say it. Uh, but she did. I pursued him. So it's not a lagging behind, but it's an actual going yeah. after what you want. And that's how God does us. He pursues us. He goes after us all the days of my life. So the writer um, wrote this, and I want to read it. It says, it's not a place, but the vitality of a relationship with the Lord that transforms the individual. It's not a specific place. It's just your relationship with him that transforms us. Yeah. Um, I'm glad she read that quote because it reminded me of something that I wrote at the beginning. The presence of God cannot be fabricated. Um, and what I mean by that is you can't make up God's presence because it doesn't have a certain set of parameters. Um, it doesn't have a specific set of circumstances. Like in other words, God can only be present when we've done A, B, C, D, or E, F, G. Because like she was just saying, is that that God's presence um, is in a relationship. It's, it's in a co-joining, and 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 the only way that a relationship can happen is by mutual acknowledgement. And so David is writing here of how. He starts out acknowledging God's presence in his life, and then he transforms it to not only have I acknowledged God's presence in my life and that he exists, but now I'm recognizing how he has paved the way for me, how he has blessed me more than I can ever even begin to fathom. And uh, I think that's where we'll find ourselves when we begin to take the initiative of recognizing God's presence in our in our moment-by-moment -moment encounters and in these moments and in your moments. Um, as, as we live out our lives. So kind of to wrap it all up, um, the writer did ask a question, and this is something for you to think about. What are some tangible ways that you have experienced God's goodness personally? I know some people um, talk about how they lived, lost a loved one and they see a sunset that makes them think of them or a sunrise. Um, one instance I read about this week, a girl was making some cinnamon toast for her kids and she talked about her mother who had passed away and lo and behold there's a bird in the house and that's a symbol of a, a loved one coming to greet you through a bird and and as you look at that and you think about that you know this is where we can get caught up looking for god's presence because we attach to it a certain level of circumstances uh, you have to be in a worship service. You have to hear a certain song. You have to do this. Um, but the people we we talk to and the people that you all are, you've experienced it. You've experienced it riding down the road. You've experienced it hearing that song. You've experienced it when you're telling your children this, this story of, of this memory. And then all of a sudden, regardless of of you know what a bird can be a symbolic of there's a bird actually in your home which is abnormal um and it's just a reminder that that god is present uh, with us and you know if we go digging for his presence we'll miss it because we'll push it aside you know what's the old saying you'll miss the forest for the trees mm -hmm. um and so uh, just this is david is if you were to write this in your your language your 21st century language with whatever job you have, with whatever day, way you fill your time, you would use regular language that would describe how you saw and experienced God's presence. You know, if you're a nurse, you work in the medical field, it would have that imagery. Uh, if you're a teacher, it would have that imagery. Uh, for David, as a shepherd, it has that imagery. And so uh, it's a beautiful one because we can all kind of get a little bit of a grasp of it. We have to work a little harder than his initial audience would have had to do. Um, but if you go and read, and, and Christy was noting this as we started the lesson, as you, uh, she and I were talking about it, but if you go and read of these, there's areas of the world where shepherding still happens the same way, okay? And it still happens in the same type of format. And some of those areas are the very areas where David would have potentially been doing this, where small flocks of sheep are being 
uh, raised and they are being cared for by a shepherd and, and the going up in the hills and coming down from the hills and, and those things that would be dangerous to a sheep and that they would not choose on their own. Uh, but yet the shepherd does it for them and for their supply. So remember this week that worry is real, not shunning worry in any way. Mm -hmm. You all have worries. I have worries. We worry too much. It's relevant. You really should worry to a certain degree about things, not the kind that's going to cause high blood pressure and ulcers, but it's okay to worry. But remember that he's been good to you in the past. He's been good to your friends in the past and your family members and everyone you can test, who can testify of his goodness. So that can help push you through the valley. Whatever it is you're going through, it can help push you out because his presence is real. And that's what we're supposed to fight through our worry because he's there with us, guiding us through it. Yeah, and one of the things that may help you as we close this out would be to uh, maybe take this psalm and write it out. Um, most of you have probably have it close, much closer to memorization than you might would think you do. Uh, and put it in a place where you can quote it to yourself throughout this week, uh, maybe in your car or somewhere like that, where you can be reminded of God's faithfulness uh, in your worry, in these distressing and difficult circumstances, that He is present and He is faithful. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. We'll probably do it again together next week. Maybe. If she'll let me. Thank y'all.